So we just want to take this initial moment just to thank some of our sponsors for their generous support and underwriting of MGFA educational webinars. Um, so Alexion, Momenta, RA Pharma, and UCB um, have generously donate, donated to support a lot of our national programming uh, in addition to these educational webinars. And I'd like to introduce Pushpa Narayana Swami. Uh, I'll read her bio. I won't do it justice. Um, it's an impressive one, I'll say. Um, but Pushpa Narayana Swami is an associate professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Boston, and the director of quality improvement at the Department of Neurology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. She received her medical degree from Bangalore Medical College, India, and completed her neurology residency at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore, India. She then completed another neurology reg residency and fellowship in neuromuscular diseases at the University of Tennessee, Memphis in the United States. Dr. Narayana Swami is board certified in neurology, clinical neurophysiology, and neuromuscular disease. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and a member of the AAN Guidelines Subcommittee. She has co-authored several peer-reviewed journals, uh, peer-reviewed articles, reviews, clinical practice guidelines, editorials, and quality measures. She has received research funding from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, as well as the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, also known as PCORI. She's an associate editor for the journal Muscle and Nerve, member of the Level of Evidence team of Neurology and serves on the editorial board of the Annals of Neurology and the Journal of Clinical Neuromuscular Disease. She chairs the Quality Improvement Committee of the American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine, also known as AANEM, and she also serves on MGFA's Medical and Scientific Advisory Board and has also contributed um, to the Research Committee of MGFA as well. In her clinical practice, she manages neuromuscular conditions with special emphasis on myasthenia gravis, myopathies, and muscular dystrophies. She was part of the international panel that developed the recent consensus guidance for the management of myasthenia gravis, and the panel is working to update the guidance. She is co-primary investigator of the PROMIS MG trial funded by PCORI and site investigator for several multinational trials of new drugs for myasthenia. Her advocacy work seeks to incorporate health services research with healthcare policy to improve patient care. On that note, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Narayana Swami uh, for her to be able to start her presentation. And, and we're so grateful to have you here. I know you have a lot of competing priorities, so I just want to thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, I appreciate that very generous introduction, and thank you all. Good grief. <laughs> How many people does it take to turn on a webinar? Um, and good evening to all of you. I'd like to thank the MGFA for um, inviting me to do this webinar. And I'd like to thank all of you for uh, spending an evening um, discussing this very important topic. Uh, could you share my slides, Jessica, or do you want me to share them? How do we do this? Yes, we'll share them. Let's see. Okay. All right. So today we are going to talk about your antibodies. So we know a lot about myasthenia gravis. We know some things about why it's, it happens, how it's caused. But many of us don't, we hear the term antibodies quite frequently, but we don't quite know exactly what they do and what they are. So for the next 30 minutes or so, 30, 35 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about, first about basic immunology. I'm going to talk about uh, what the immune system does, what basic immunology is, what is an antigen, what is an antibody, and then switch gears to how do antibodies play a role in myasthenia gravis? And how does the presence or absence of antibodies help us uh, diagnose and also treat myasthenia gravis? So if you go on Google or anywhere on the internet and try to search a definition, or search for a definition of myasthenia gravis, 
this is uh, something that you may find. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease in which antibodies bind to acetylcholine receptors or related proteins in the postsynaptic membrane at the neuromuscular junction and cause weakness of skeletal muscles. Now, if we were in a live audience, I would ask for a show of hands and say, how many of you feel like this guy over here? Because this has this definition has a lot of uh, words that are difficult to understand. And so we're going to parse this definition out a little bit. I'm a history buff, and so I like to start most of my talks uh, with some history of the disease or the treatment or whatever it is I'm talking about. So myasthenia gravis was first described by Thomas Willis, a 17th century Oxford physician in 1672. I'm not going to read this full uh, description here, but if you see here, there are some very pertinent features that we know are uh, characteristic of the disease even today. An honest woman, so younger women are more prone to develop the condition, who for many years has been obnoxious to this sort of spurious palsy. So it's a palsy, which is, means it's a weakness, but it's a spurious weakness because it's not there all the time. Not only in her members, which are the limbs, but also in her tongue. And then he describes and says, for some time she can speak freely and readily, but after she has spoken long, she becomes as mute as a fish and no, she cannot recover the use of her voice for an hour or two. Talking about both limb involvement and bulbar involvement, and then about the characteristic neuromuscular fatigue ability. So you use the muscle for a while and then you cannot use it any longer and you wait for a while and then the muscle recovers. How about some history of treatments of myasthenia gravis? Mary Walker was a house physician at St. Alfred's Hospital in Greenwich, London. And in 1934, uh, Dr. Denny Brown, uh, who was one of the pioneers of neurology in the United States and professor of neurology at the Harvard Medical School, visited uh, St. Alfred's Hospital in Greenwich and saw a patient with myasthenia gravis. He explained to the audience at that time that myasthenia gravis resembled curare poisoning. And for those of you who may not know, curare is a poison derived from a plant that South American uh, warriors use on, their, on the tips of their arrows as a poison. Dr. Walker knew that the effect of curare could be reversed by physostigmine, and she therefore tried physostigmine on one patient with remarkable improvement. She reported this in the journal, The Lancet in 1934, and subsequently she used a synthetic, less toxic form of the same compound called neostigmine in one other patient and documented improvement. We still have neostigmine injections available, although as you all know, for symptomatic management now, we tend to use pyridostigmine, which tends to have less gastrointestinal side effects and is also, that also has a longer duration of action. So what is myasthenia gravis? We often refer to it as a snowflake disease. Why is that? Because it behaves so differently in different patients. Some patients have ocular involvement, others on the other end of the spectrum may have respiratory crisis at the onset of the disease. Uh, it can involve the bulbar muscles, the limb muscles, and it progresses in different ways in many patients. It involves, uh, it affects all ages of patients, both sexes and all ethnicities, and the prevalence we believe is about 20 per 100,000. We have subsets of myasthenia gravis, so we classify our patients into subsets. And these subsets, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more because they're closely related to antibodies. And the subsets that we classify patients into Im impact how we treat these patients. Uh, a thymoma or a malignancy of the thymus gland is present in about 10 to 15 percent of patients, and the disease can be difficult to control with treatment 
in approximately 10 to 20% of patients. Many of you or all of you are familiar with the symptoms of myasthenia gravis. The characteristic symptom is fluctuating weakness of specific muscles. So what does fluctuating weakness mean? It means that the weakness worsens with the repetitive use of those muscles. If you're watching TV for a long time, you're exercising the muscles of the eyes, the extraocular muscles and the muscles of the eyelids. And so they get weaker uh, and you may develop droopy eyelids or double vision. And if you stop watching TV and close your eyes for a while, the weakness improves and so rest improves the weakness. The symptoms of myasthenia may affect the ocular muscles, including drooping of the eyelids and double vision, as I said. Oftentimes, this is asymmetric, which means one side may be worse than the other. The symptoms may also affect the bulbar muscles or the facial muscles with difficulty in chewing or swallowing and difficulty with smiling, whistling, or keeping food in the mouth. And of course, limb muscles, where the proximal muscles, which mean the muscles of the shoulder, around the shoulder and around the hips, are most, more affected than the more distal or the more uh, other muscles that are further away from the body, such as those of the hands or the feet. Uh, there may be difficulty in holding up the head, and there may, there may also be shortness of breath due to involvement of the respiratory muscles. We talked about subgroups, and this is a nice review uh, recently published uh, and uh, authored by Nils uh, Eric Gilhus, who was one of the authors of the consensus guidance that uh, Jessica spoke about. So if you look at the screen here, so you see a, a subgroup here, that's the name of the subgroup, but you'll see commonality with antibodies. So the subgroups are pretty much defined first by the antibodies and subsequently by other features, including the age at onset and abnormalities of the thymus. So for instance, the, uh, if, they, if patients have antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor, they may be early onset subgroup, which means they, uh, the onset of the disease is less than 50 years. And in those patients, hyperplasia of the thymus or overgrowth of the thymus is common. Those patients with acetylcholine receptor antibodies, so the same antibodies may also have late onset myasthenia gravis with onset over 50 years of age. But in those patients, thymic hyperplasia is not seen. Instead, the thymus involutes or is atrophic or is very small. Similarly, acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients may have thymoma and they can have onset of age at any time. Finally, then you have the musk antibodies. You come to a second group of antibodies, musk antibodies. So they have musk myasthenia. That's what we call the subgroup, musk myasthenia. So based on the antibody, the age of onset can be any and the thymus is usually normal. There is also another antibody, the LRP4 antibody. Uh, again, age of onset is maybe at any time and the thymus is normal, but the subgroup is here defined really by the antibody because here it, the, it's common to both. The age of onset and the thymus normality is common to both. There is a group of patients who uh, do not have any detectable antibodies. And as time goes, this group gets smaller and smaller because more and more antibodies are uh, are detected in patients in this subgroup. Initially, we just had the acetylcholine receptor antibody. And then uh, once the musk antibody was detected, the seronegative subgroup became smaller and so on and so forth. Ocular myasthenia gravis, so myasthenia gravis affecting the eye muscles alone, may be associated with any of these antibodies. How do we make a diagnosis of myasthenia gravis? It is a clinical diagnosis as I mentioned earlier, characterized by weakness made worse by activity, improved by rest, only to have the weakness recur with resumed activity. It is confirmed by electrophysiology. Some of you may have had repetitive nerve stimulation or single fiber EMG for diagnosis, or serology with the presence of antibodies, which is the topic of our talk today, and pharmacological response to 
drugs that increase the amount of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. So let's talk a little bit about the neuromuscular junction. So in the definition, we had many terms. We had antibodies, we had neuromuscular junctions. So let's take the term neuromuscular junction. This is a picture, a representation of the neuromuscular junction. This is a nerve cell body, and this is the axon, the nerve fiber that goes down to the muscle. And when it approaches the muscle fibers, the terminal axon divides into multiple nerve twigs or terminals. The ends of each of these terminals widens to form a button, a terminal button like that. And each of these nerve terminals supplies one muscle fiber. The junction between the nerve terminal and the muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. <coughs> but between the nerve terminal and the muscle fiber, there is an actual space. So the electrical signal from the nerve terminal has to cross the space and go to the muscle fiber membrane. This is called the postsynaptic membrane. This is the presynaptic membrane, and this is the postsynaptic membrane. We'll talk a little bit more about these structures here. <coughs> but now you've sort of talked about two terms, the neuromuscular junction and the postsynaptic membrane that we saw in the definition. So let's look, take a closer look at the neuromuscular junction. This is the nerve terminal button, and acetylcholine lives in the nerve terminal in these packets, little packets called quanta. This is the muscle membrane, and that's the postsynaptic membrane. So this is a presynaptic because this is the synapse, the junction. Presynaptic membrane, postsynaptic membrane. These are the acetylcholine receptors that you see here. <coughs> so that was the other term we saw, antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. And this is a blown up picture of the acetylcholine receptor. It has five subunits and it crosses the muscle membrane. It goes through the muscle membrane. The postsynaptic membrane is folded up so that there is more space for many, many acetylcholine receptors. You also see some of the other antibody terms we saw here. You see musk here, you see LRP4, and <laughs> several other related proteins. So these are the related proteins that you noticed in the definition. So let's switch gears here and talk a little bit about what antibodies are. And in order to do so, let's talk a little bit about the immune system. We share our environment with numerous microbial organisms, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, etc and a host of to toxic substances, all of which can induce an allergic response in our bodies. The immune system consists of different organs, cells and proteins that work together to protect the body from foreign organisms and substances. And each component of this immune system performs a specific task to recognize and react against these foreign antigens. So what are the organs of the immune system? The thymus gland, which we uh, know quite a bit about, is a, is a gland that is in the upper part of the chest. So what does the thy thymus gland do? Some cells called lymphocytes from, from the bone marrow, they are immature lymphocytes. They travel to the thymus, to thymus gland through the blood, and there they become mature lymphocytes and learn to recognize antigens. And we'll talk about that just a little bit more. The liver is the organ that produces some of the proteins uh, that are important in the immune system, including complements. The bone marrow, uh, which is the red stuff inside the bones, produces blood cells, lymphocytes, that form antibodies, and also other lymphocytes called T lymphocytes that contribute to the uh, immune response. The tonsils are a group of lymph lymphoid tissue or lots of lymphocytes in the back of the throat. Lymph nodes in our body are also groups of lymphocytes. Here the lymphocytes actually communicate with each other. The spleen is an organ that sits sort of right here and has lots of blood supply and here and also lots of lymphocytes. Here the blood and all of the antigens or foreign substances that are in the blood 
can actually come in contact with the immune system. And the blood, of course, uh, carries the cells of the immune system and the proteins to where they're supposed to be going. So we talked about some terms. I mentioned some terms, antigen and antibody. So what is an antigen? An antigen is any foreign substance. It may be a bacterium, it may be a virus, it may be a protein uh, that is capable of inducing, of being recognized by the immune system. So the, our immune system recognizes it as a foreign substance and it induces an immune response. So something that fights against that antigen and oftentimes the immune response is characterized by the production of antibodies. What, what are T cells? T cells are cells, whoops, sorry. That attack cells that are in, infected by an antigen. So antigens can be dealt with in two different ways. One, the, a cell called a T cell can attack the antigen and destroy it. On the other hand, you have B cells that arise in the bone marrow and convert into plasma cells and produce antibodies. So the cells directly don't attack the antigen. Instead, they produce antibodies. And so this is an antibody. And what does the antibody do? The antibody is a protein molecule and it attaches to the antigens like a lock and key. So it's like pieces of a puzzle. It fits together and then it destroys the antigen and it prevents the antigen from binding to human cells and destroys it or marks it for destruction by these cells, by the T cells. So it's a very complicated system and I'm trying to simplify it and just give you these two big groups of, uh, of uh, immune responses. So the T cells that themselves attack the antigens and the B cells that form antibodies that in turn either directly attack the antigens or prime them for destruction by the T cells. There are several different types of antibodies. Now each antibody, as I said, is a protein and each antibody has a light chain and a heavy chain. It's this Y-shaped structure. There are two light chains and two heavy chains. And the Y, the arms of the Y are where antigens bind. Whereas this, uh, the limb of the Y, is just the protein structure that remains constant. So this variable region is where the antigens bind has to be different to recognize different types of antigens. There are several subgroups of antigens, IgA, D, E, G, and M. We are mostly interested in IgG antibodies because those are the ones that are secreted oftentimes in response to any sort of antigenic stimulation, be it a bacterial infection, uh, and IgM is also secreted. So the first immune response, say you have a cold and your body forms antibodies against the cold virus or the influenza virus. The initial response that is formed is this huge antibody. So it has these five sub units here attached to a central structure. So five of these arms of the Y, uh, y structures and that is the IgM molecule. As time goes by, the anti antibody response changes to one of the IgG antibody response, which is a smaller, simpler antibody. So as we said, the immune system is programmed to recognize self proteins. So we know that it recognizes foreign proteins and fights against them. But in order to do so, it must first be programmed to be able to recognize what's not foreign. And so what is self? So what is what it should not be destroyed? Uh, and it's activated whenever a foreign antigen is recognized by the antibodies. And we said once it's recognized, the antigen is destroyed by multiple mechanisms. But this whole immune activation process is very tightly regulated because we have to be able to recognize only foreign substances and destroy them while at the same time preserving all of the antigens or proteins that are present in the bodies, which are self proteins. So they cannot be recognized as antigens. But there are certain times when there's a failure of the immune response. And there are several different uh, scenarios where this may happen. Autoimmunity is one that we hear quite often. 
So what happens with autoimmunity? Here, there is a failure of the immune system to recognize self uh, structures or proteins as not being antigens. And then the immune system mounts a immune response towards self proteins and therefore to, towards tissues of your own body. So our, it, the immune system fights against our own tissues. There are also hypersensitivity reaction where there is an overactive immune response, which then causes inflammation. So these are allergies to drugs, for instance, or allergies to bee venom or allergies to foods such as peanuts. These are hypersensitivity reactions. Things that should not cause such a severe reaction causes a very, very severe reaction that may cause a lot of tissue inflammation and even death. And then finally, there are scenarios where the, there is an ineffective immune response we know of the human immunodeficiency virus that causes an acquired in immunodeficiency syndrome, but there are also uh, congenital uh, syndromes where uh, people cannot put forth an immune response. Uh, the one that we are going to discuss most today is autoimmunity. And why is that? Because here in my senior gravis, the acetylcholine receptor and the related proteins like musk or LRP4 are self proteins. They should not be recognized as foreign substances and they should not cause an immune response. But because there is a failure of recognition of those as self, uh, there is autoimmunity, which means the immune system now forms antibodies against these self proteins, the acetylcholine receptor, uh, the musk receptor, the musk protein, and the LRP protein, and some other proteins. So, and I just said this, so myasthenia gravis therefore is an autoimmune disorder that is caused by autoantibodies to the acetylcholine receptor or to related proteins. So what do, do these antibodies do? Let's talk first about the acetylcholine receptor. So this is the acetylcholine receptor. This is the postsynaptic membrane. This is the presynaptic membrane. And these tiny things here that you see are antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. Sometimes what they do is they, one way in which they act is to modulate the, anti, uh, the, uh, the acetylcholine receptors. So basically they cross link. So two of these antibodies join together. So this is the Y shaped antibody. The two arms of the Y uh, attach to, to the acetylcholine receptors that are next to each other and they cross link these receptors and they destroy them. The other way they can act on the acetylcholine receptor is just to sit on that acetylcholine receptor individually. Where is my pointer here? Individually and just basically block the receptor. So you may have heard of tests that look for acetylcholine binding antibodies, blocking antibodies and modulating antibodies. So modulating antibodies are the tests that detect these antibodies. Blocking antibodies are those that test det detect these particular antibodies that function this way. And then finally, the, what we think is the most important mechanism of action of these antibodies in Mycenae gravis is called complement mediated lysis. What happens here? So the antibodies combine with the um, acetylcholine receptor and then they activate a complex of proteins that I mentioned was produced in the liver called the complement complex. This is a complex of nine proteins and they're called C1 and they're numbered C1 through C9. So when the acetylcholine receptor antibodies attach to the receptor, the C1 complex is activated and that causes a sequential activation of the other components of the complement system. And once the, you get to C5, C5 is then broken down to C5A and C5B. So you see that here, C5A and C5B. And once C5B is formed, it combines to the rest of the component. So C5B through C9, C6, C7, C8, and C9. And that complex is called um, the membrane attack complex or MAC. And what that MAC complex does is to destroy the postsynaptic membrane and therefore, there isn't any room for the acetylcholine molecules to attach to the acetylcholine receptors, 
and cause muscle contraction. And that is what causes myasthenia gravis. Let's talk a little bit about the thymus. We are not quite sure what the exact cause of the autoantibody production in myasthenia gravis is due to. But the thymus is a central organ where we talked about this immunological tolerance of the cell. So to be able to tolerate all of our own proteins and not mount a response against them, that's what the thymus teaches lymphocytes to do. It teaches the cells. The cells go from the bone marrow to the thymus and there they learn how to not fight against cell proteins. The thymus has uh, cells that look very much like muscles and muscle cells and express a stylocholine receptor on their surface. <clears throat> the T cells in the thymus recognize that acetylcholine receptor and somewhere along the way, this tolerance of the cell to the acetylcholine receptor goes awry. And that causes a breakdown of cell tolerance and therefore the immunologic response to the acetylcholine receptor. The most common antibodies detected in myasthenia gravis are directed against the acetylcholine receptor, muscle-specific kinase or MUSC, and low-density lipoprotein re re receptor-related protein or LRP4. There are additional antibodies that are directed against several proteins, and you saw some of these in the picture of the neuromuscular junction that I showed you, agrin, titan, cortactin, collagen Q, etc. We are not sure if these actually cause neuromuscular junction damage or they just are bystanders there and they don't actually cause the weakness. Let's talk a little bit about how these antibodies act and how we use these antibodies in the diagnosis and treatment of myasthenia gravis. Approximately 50% of patients with ocular myasthenia gravis have antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor and approximately 70 to 80% of patients with generalized myasthenia gravis have these antibodies. And we talked about the mechanism of action. Complement mediated lysis is the most important mechanism, but they can also modulate and block the, the receptors. Uh, the antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor are useful in making the diagnosis, but they are less useful in monitoring response to the disease. By this, I mean, so if you take a group of patients and you measure their antibody levels and you see how much of the antibody they have in their system, and you try and correlate whether the amount of antibodies corresponds to the severity of the disease, you'll find it that it doesn't usually pan out that way. So the amount of antibodies in the group of patients, so it's not like higher num amounts of antibodies correlate with severe disease. But in individual patients, usually the antibodies stabilize or drop once the disease is in control. And if there is an exacerbation, they tend to rise. But they're not very useful markers to follow up. So I tend not to do them very often in the clinical setting. I will do them for diagnosis, but I don't necessarily repeat them to see if they've gone away uh, sometimes if I worry about a relapse and I'm not sure if there's a relapse, I may do uh, check the antibodies again to see if they're going up. But if there's not much of a difference, then it doesn't give me a lot of information. Musk is a protein that you saw that was at the postsynaptic membrane in the picture that I showed you earlier. What does it do? It actually is responsible for bringing together a whole bunch of the acetylcholine receptors uh, and, and maintaining the postsynaptic membrane. So it's important for the structure of the acetylcholine receptors. And you want to cluster a whole bunch of the acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction postsynaptic membrane because you want to have the maximum chance for the acetylcholine to combine with these receptors so that efficient muscle contraction can be produced. Musk antibodies are found in approximately 1 to 10% of patients with myasthenia gravis. And unlike the um, um, acetylcholine receptor uh, antibodies, they do not activate complement. What they tend to do is to prevent the interaction of musk with some of the other proteins, LRP4, cortactin, agrin, all of which are responsible for clustering the uh, 
acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have less than normal amounts of acetylcholine receptors at the uh, neuromuscular junction. So this should be acetylcholine receptors, not antibodies, I'm sorry. Unlike in acetylcholine receptor uh, 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 antibody positive myosinia gravis, levels of antibodies uh, to musk actually correlate with disease activity and I use it more frequently to see how the disease is doing. Very rare patients have both acetylcholine receptor and musk antibodies. The third set of antibodies is antibodies to the LRP4, the low density related light, low density light protein related protein 4. Uh, what does LRP do? LRP interacts with another protein called agrin, and agrin actually comes from the presynaptic terminal. So it's come from the end of the nerve. And that, in turn, that interaction between LRP4 and agrin triggers musk activation and therefore helps with clustering of the uh, of the neuromus of the acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. And when the when there is an antibody to LRP4, this disrupts the interaction between LRP4 and agrin, and therefore, again, the eventual end result of all of these antibodies is that there's less antibodies, uh, there's less acetylcholine, there are less acetylcholine receptors at the postsynaptic membrane because the clustering effect is no longer there. Uh, 7 to 33 percent of patients who do not have either acetylcholine receptor or musk antibodies, so these are people we refer to as double zero negative myasthenia gravis. These patients of these double zero negatives, seven to 33 percent of patients may have LRP4 antibodies. Approximately eight percent of patients who have acetylcholine receptor antibodies and 15 percent of patients who have musk antibodies also can have these antibodies. And also detected in other uh, disorders, including Lou Gehrig's disease. So they're not really specific for the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Uh, although when they are associated with myasthenia gravis, the myasthenia gravis tends to be milder or pure ocular. So it's difficult to use LRP4 antibodies for the diagnosis because they're not really very specific. Cortaptin is a fourth antibody that I'll discuss today. Again, same mechanism of action because it is involved in this pathway of agrin, LRP4, musk, cortactin uh, interaction and clustering of antibodies. It is found in approximately 20% of patients uh, who are double zero negative, so who, have, who don't have acetylcholine receptor or musk antibodies. It's also found in 5% of patients with acetylcholine receptor antibodies. But again, it has, like LRP4, it has been described in other disorders, including polymyositis, which is an inflammatory disorder of the muscle, again, an autoimmune disorder. For some reason, cortactin antibodies do not appear to be associated with musk or LRP4 antibodies, just with acetylcholine receptor antibodies. It's not clear if they actually cause disease. If the antibodies are present, they more frequently cause ocular or milder disease and bulbar involvement is less frequent. So to summarize, acetylcholine receptor antibodies are present in 50% of ocular and 80% of generalized myasthenia gravis. The features of myasthenia associated with this are that they could be early onset, below 50 years, late onset, after 50 years. The early onset has hypoplastic thymus, the late onset has an atrophic thymus. Uh, <clears throat> and then of course, they're also associated with thymoma. Musk antibodies, many of these patients are women uh, and they have severe early bulbar involvement, difficulty with chewing, speaking, swallowing, respiratory involvement with shortness of breath and uh, respiratory failure is more frequent. And this, uh, pa these patients can have atrophy of the muscle. That means there's wasting of the muscle, loss of muscle. And limb weakness is less common than in acetylcholine receptor antib antibody related myasthenia gravis. And the ocular muscles may be spared. So these are very bulbar predominant young women. It's important to know that in this subset, in terms of treatment strategies, pyridostigmine is ineffective or even may worsen symptoms.
Uh, 3,4 diaminopyridine, which is used in Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome, may be useful to help symptoms. And in terms of immunosuppressive treatments, there is some data that rituximab may be useful in these patients, probably more so than in acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenic gravis. And as I said earlier, LRP4 antibody uh, related myasthenia gravis is mild and may not need immunosuppressive agents. So what are our treatment objectives when we treat patients? We want you to return to normal function. And what does that mean? We want to achieve remission, which means, and we have definitions of remission, which means you may be on medications, but you don't have any symptoms or any signs of myasthenia gravis, or you may be on medications, and when we see you, we may find mild weakness, but you don't have any functional symptoms. But in addition to achieving remission, we want to make sure that patients have minimal side effects. We have to individualize therapy depending on the disease severity, distribution of the disease. Is it purely ocular? Is there a lot of bulbar involvement? What is the amount of respiratory involvement, et cetera? Rate of progression, how fast is it progressing? Do we need to jump in there and give patients plasma exchange to stop it, stop the progression quickly? Or do we have time to give them steroids and wait for about four weeks? What coexisting diseases are present? If someone has diabetes, do we really want to give them steroids? Patient age and sex, how about pregnancy, wanting to get pregnant, <coughs> breastfeeding? Lifestyle and career choices. Is it someone who has a very demanding job, a physical job, and of course, cost considerations? So let's talk a little bit about some of these new drugs that target these antibodies and how they do this. So we talked about complement, and I'm going to talk about this in this little picture here, slightly more in detail. So the first step that happens is that the acetylcholine receptor antibodies, let me get my glasses here. So these are the acetylcholine receptors and these gray ones are the antibodies. They bind to the acetylcholine receptors and then they activate the C1 complex. That's the first step. And then after that, once the whole complex is activated, C2 gets activated, C3, and then eventually C5, C5, this is C5, and it gets cleaved to C5A and C5B. The little light green are the C5Bs, and these are the C5As. And that launches the subsequent terminal uh, comp complement complex, also called the membrane attack complex. And the membrane attack complex damages the, so you see these folds here at the postsynaptic membrane. The membrane attack complexes damage the postsynaptic membrane and there's no more postsynaptic membrane folding left and there are no acetylcholine receptors. So then one way to control the disease may be to inhibit C5A, C5B, right? I mean, if we stop the cleavage of complement, then we would be able to do that. Uh, we would be potentially able to stop the damage to the postsynaptic membrane. And so that is what uh, echolizumab does. Uh, so here you see the acetylcholine receptors. A C1 is activated, but then this compound, echolizumab, combines to this complex, C5. It just basically combines to C5. So this is C5A plus B, C5, and it prevents C5 from cleaving into C5A plus B, and therefore there isn't any membrane attack complex, and there's no destruction of the postsynaptic membrane. So, and then we have another drug now in studies, ravulizumab, that has similar uh, action, mechanism of action, but has a longer duration of action. So I think I told you this already. So how about any other mechanisms of action? Now, we do have several subclasses of IgG. So I told you that the IgG antibodies are ones that we're interested in. Several subclasses. So we have IgG1, G2, G3, G4. The acetylcholine receptor antibodies are mostly of the IgG1 and IgG3 class. So, and, so you can use, uh, and then they, of course, you know that they act by complement inhibition. So you can use echolizumab. Uh, to 
treat acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia. However, musk antibodies are IgG4 and they don't activate complement. So we really can't use uh, echolizumab or ravulizumab to treat musk myasthenia gravis. But there may be ways of removing these antibodies from the circulation. And that's what we do with plasma exchange. But are there drugs that do this? So how, what happens to immunoglobulins or antibodies? So these are all the whole IgG. What happens? How, is, how are they normally recycled in the body? So this is the blood. And at the physiologic pH of blood, which is alkaline 7.4, you have the IgG molecules. And then they enter the cell. This is the inside of the cell. And inside the cell, they enter these round structures called endosomes. And the endosome is an acidic structure. At the acidic pH of the endosomes, the, ant the antibody, so IgG, enters the endosomes and it combines to a co complex called the FCRN. It's called FCRN receptors, okay? And when, once it combines to this complex, it then travels out of the endosome and is released back from the complex at the surface of the cell because the pH is now alkaline. So all of the IgG that is combined to the FCRN molecule receptor just goes out. So it basically gets recycled and doesn't get destroyed. The IgG that is not bound to the FCRN receptor gets destroyed. So you can imagine where if we took away binding from the FCRN, we could make all of those antibodies go away. We could just destroy all the antibodies. So let's look at that. So this is what a group of drugs called FCRN antagonists do. Uh, there's one that's already completed the initial trials and it's in a phase three trial. Then there's another, a, a couple of others. I think there are two that have been completed initial trials and there are two others that are actually in trials now, initial trials. Uh, so if you look at this, this is the IgG. These are the serum proteins. So they enter the as, uh, acidified endosome in the cell. And so this is the FCRN that would bind. But here you have this compound M281. So this is one of the uh, FCRN receptor blockers or FCRN antagonists. It binds to the FCRN and doesn't allow IgG to bind to the FCRN. And therefore, IgG gets destroyed. Instead of recycling back, it gets destroyed. So that is how these FCRN antagonists work. So that is another mechanism of targeting antibodies. So this is sort of just destroying the antibodies sort of doing plex with a medication. So instead of removing the antibodies out of the system, you just make them turn over quickly and get destroyed in the system. So what may some future therapies be? So these future therapies may be targeted to antibodies or to their effects. So for instance, we now have targeted, and anti, uh, targeted therapies to complement inhibition. So the antibodies that cause the membrane attack complexes. So you inhibit the formation of the membrane attack complexes. FCRN antibodies, uh, I'm sorry, FCRN antagonists or blockers block both, both IgG1 and IgG4. They block any, anti, any immunoglobulins, right? And so they may be effective both in acetylcholine receptor and in musk myasthenia gravis. So perhaps at some point, we may have a cocktail of these targeted treatments to, to target, to both remove the antibody and also to reduce the effect of the antibody at the neuromuscular junction. So thank you very much. I think that's it. And I do we have time for questions. Yeah, so we have a few questions over the chat box as well as in the Q&A area. So there are multiple ways for folks to ask questions. You can pose it over the chat box, or if you look on the bottom uh, of your screen, you'll also see a Q&A option, which is the fourth option, and you can pose a question there. Um, so we'll kind of get started. Um, one question that we have from Janelle is, I have, a mod I have modulating ACH R A B as well as voltage gated calcium channel A B. Is this common? Um, so no, Janelle, hi. Thank you for your question. No, this is quite uh, uncommon. Um, and it, 
it's not usual. So that I would say, yes, it's, it's rather uncommon. Okay, thank you. And a question that we have from Frank, are there any drug trials on patients with zero negative antibodies? I was told that nothing in my blood shows that I have MG. I have had a bad thymus and it was taken out trans, transurnal split. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Frank. Yes, um, seronegative uh, myelinogivus can be challenging. Um, and at this time, we don't quite know exactly what antibodies they may have. We do believe that most seronegative patients probably have some kind of antibodies that we are not detecting. And most trials, unfortunately, uh, do not include patients with seronegative myosina gravis because we don't know how they would respond. So when you do a clinical trial, you want a very uniform subgroup of patients. You want patients who are very similar, and that's why we have strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. And uh, so that the only difference, so we have two groups of patients, one group that gets the treatment, the other group that doesn't get the treatment gets a placebo or a or no treatment or just regular treatment. And the, if we have very similar people in both those groups, we know then that any differences in their disease over time is due to the treatment itself and not due to any other factor due to uh, that may be just their disease, the natural history of the disease. Because we don't quite know seronegative myosina gravis as well, and we believe that it may be associated with multiple different types of antibodies, uh, we tend not to include them in trials at this time, unfortunately. However, in terms of treatments, many of us believe that seronegative myosin agravis acts very much like acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myosin agravis, and typically treatments are directed towards seronegative myosin agravis, similar to what we would do with acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myosin agravis. Thank you so much. And we have a question from Joanna. How often should I be tested for antibodies or given the blood test? Right, so um, as I mentioned briefly, uh, Joanna, it depends on the kind of antibodies and your doctor should be able to answer this uh, better. Uh, but generally, you know, in terms of general principles, the acetylcholine receptor antibody, as I mentioned, I don't test often. Uh, I test it to make a diagnosis, and then I may never test it in patients again if they're doing well. Patients who are doing poorly, I may test it to see if the levels are rising uh, and you know, to see whether that may be indicative of a relapse. But otherwise, I don't. In musk mycenae, uh, on the other hand, Musk antibodies tend to correlate with the disease, and so I may use them more frequently to see how my patients are responding to treatment. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, and a few more questions that we have. In 2018, I had a post-ERCP infection that went systemic. Um, and there were other complications as well as pneumonia and vertigo and double vision. Um, the question is, could these infections and heavy doses of antibiotics have caused myasthenia gravis? That's a very good question. So we don't know of any infections that cause myasthenia gravis, but certainly infections can precipitate myasthenia gravis. So often, uh, somebody may develop myosin gravis on the background of an infection. So it may manifest first during an acute infection. And uh, many of you may know that if you develop an infection, you already have myosin gravis and you develop an infection, your symptoms can become worse. So yes, infections can exacerbate myosinic symptoms, but I don't think they, they are likely to cause myosin. Thank you so much. And a question we have from Mandy. Um, 
If a patient has positive ACHR antibodies, responds to mestinon, presents clinically with symptoms, but has negative single fiber EMG results, do they have mycenia or does the negative, negative single fiber EMG rule it out? Okay. Um, so Mandy, that's a good question. So the, we talk about single fiber EMG as being the most sensitive test for mycena gravis. Uh, but we also say that the acetylcholine receptor antibodies are highly specific for, for myasthenia gravis. So it's a little bit of a nuanced um, question because it also depends very much on the clinical presentation. So I have seen patients who have very low titer acetylcholine antibodies. I mean, really just above normal limit. Uh, and they ha do not look clinically like myasthenia gravis and their single fiber EMG is negative. Uh, on the other hand, I've seen patients who have clearly, clinically, they look like myasthenia gravis, and as you said, respond to mestinon, uh, uh, yeah, and so look very much clinically in terms of symptoms and pharmacological response like myasthenia gravis, uh, have acetylcholine receptor antibodies, but have a negative single fiber EMG. Now, that can happen for many reasons. It may be because that muscle is not involved or it may be because they took mestinone, sometimes it can mask uh, a positive single fiber EMG. So if you have a negative single fiber EMG in a muscle that's clinically weak at that time, that pretty much says, oh, you know what, mycenae is very, very unlikely. So this is a nuanced question. It depends really a lot on the clinical picture. The clinical picture is very important. Uh, and of course, some factors to do with the single fiber EMG and the titer, how high the antibody titers are. All of these things would sort of um, make me decide which way to go. Is this really myasthenia gravis or is this not? Thank you so much. And we have a question from Jurgen. How sensitive are the antibody tests? For example, how likely are false negatives? Yeah, so it depends on the lab. Uh, hi, Jurgen. Um, depends on the lab. Uh, some people will say uh, it's, uh, you know, you never have a false positive. I mean, if you have a positive test, it is myasthenia gravis. As I said, um, I have seen very low titer antibodies. It's not often, um, you know, it's hard to say, uh, you know, in terms of uh, specificity, uh, you know, about false positives here for two reasons. Number one, we tend not to send these out in the normal population, right? We'll only send these out in patients who we suspect of having myasthenia gravis. So it's hard to put a number to it. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there's any data. We know they are very highly sensitive, but how specific are they? I mean, is that only in myasthenia gravis or do we see them? We, we believe they are very specific too. Uh, sensitivity, you, we know that 50% in ocular, 70 to 80% uh, in generalized acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And we talked about musk, et cetera. But specificity, uh, do we see them only in mycena gravis? I believe not. I don't know that there's a number for the reason that I just mentioned. We don't send them out in other people. But I personally have seen, and I know colleagues, we've talked about it, have seen, but these tend to be very low titer and uh, they tend uh, not, uh, and the clinical picture is usually not suggested. Thank you so much. And we have a question from Giselle. Uh, her question is, could Lyme antibodies or other disease antibodies be ca cause a form of zero negative myasthenia via immune activation? Uh, could it interact with genetic predisposing factors like variants such as SYNE1 or COL6A1? other types of zero negative? Yeah, um, I do not believe so. And there's also some really great feedback. So she also mentioned this is one of the best and least confusing presentations about myasthenia gravis that she has ever seen. And a lot of other participants echoed that. So I wanted to share that nice feedback. Thank you, I'm, I'm really glad, thank you. <laughs> and we have a question from Lois, uh, Lewis. Do antibodies change over time? If you are LRP4 now, could you switch to musk or other, other types of antibodies? Yeah, good question again. Usually not. As I mentioned, there are a few people we know uh, who have both acetylcholine receptor and musk antibodies, or a few people who have acetylcholine receptor and LRP4 antibodies or contacted antibodies. Um, but the antibody status does not usually change over time. 
Okay. In fact, people who are completely in remission may still have, you know, fairly high levels of acetylcholine receptor antibodies, uh, and we don't treat them. We don't treat the antibodies. We have a request, uh, question from Rebecca. FCRN blockers seem like they would have to be used cautiously or might be contraindicted in patients with CVID, uh, like complement inhibitors are. Is that so? And are there other drugs that you know of in the works that could be used with CVID? With what? I'm sorry, Jessica. Uh, common variable immunodeficiency. Yeah. So uh, patients with common variable immunodeficiency uh, and myasthenia gravis, I'm not sure one would have to, that would have to be a very rare combination. So I don't know too much about common variable immunodeficiency. I know that they are prone to infections. Whether they are prone to autoimmunity, I do not know. Uh, so, uh, but yes, I mean, you would use anything. Uh, you, you would use um, drugs such as FCR and antagonists very carefully in patients who already had an underlying problem uh, with the immune system, yes. Thank you so much. And we have a question from Peter. Um, can you speak to the destruction of the membrane at the neuromuscular junction? Do we eventually regrow ACHR receptors? Is yes. it considered, per, is myasthenia considered permanently degenerative? Yeah, so again, very good question. So yes, the hope is that, you know, we arrest the disease and the, the, the proteins, you know, most receptors in our bodies have a recycling time. They normally recycle, so they normally get destroyed and regenerate. So the hope is that they'll regenerate, and you know, and that's that that's part of the natural history of the disease, and then or or with drugs to get them into remission. However, uh, we do believe that if it goes on long enough, there may be some damage that may be permanent, and that's the. Uh, that, that is one of the impetus I think we all have to treat aggressively and to get the disease in full remission as soon as we possibly can. And we have a question from Jessica. Are there any drugs that can mask antibodies? For example, metformin. Well, I don't believe so. Thank you so much. And a question from Jen. I am being retested for antibodies. Should I take my period period of stigmine, my apologies for the, for the bad pronunciation before the test. Should I take my mastinon or period of stigmine before the test? Yes, you can take all your medications before the test. Uh, the medications will not affect the antibody testing levels. Okay, and we'll just take a few more questions. I know we have quite a few coming through, so I apologize. We'll try to get to everyone as much as we can. Um, Can we've already talked about that one? Is there any research being done on low dose naltrexine for MG? Um, no, and they so they're asking if there's any research around that drug in the Mycenae gravis space. Not that I'm aware. Okay. And a few folks that want to ask a question. Okay, I'm going to unmute the line for Giselle so that she can answer a question, uh, pose a question. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, I, I, um, I was, I was wanting to know um, a little bit more about. Um, because I've just had a 16 year history of uh, myasthenia gravis symptoms that get worse with infection, different medications, heat and stress, and um, symptoms improve with rest, mastinon, ice, and um, like cold and calm. Um, I've had a uh, negative uh, electrodiagnostic testing so far, but one borderline musk result. Um, and this is spanning about 16 years of my life. Um, and I've very, very recently been diagnosed with Lyme disease, a form of uh, neuroborreliosis. Mm -hmm. And um, recently the, um, the infectious disease doctor uh, spoke with the physician at the CDC here in British Columbia mm -hmm. um, regarding a question that 
um, actually my naturopath and I had posed regarding whether or not there could be some form of, of uh, seronegative um, myasthenia gravis like presentation because in many ways it seems to respond to at least mestinon and other um, interventions like MG. Uh, I also have a bit of ptosis, um, whether or not Lyme could be a piece of that. And um, the, the short answer was kind of a yes, but I wondered about um, like tick paralysis and if like, you know, you had mentioned that certain infections could be a triggering event for MG, but you wouldn't consider that causative. You would consider that more of an exacerbative type of uh, phenomenon? Yes. Okay. So is your question about the neuroborreliosis and relationship to your symptoms? Well, it's about whether or not I could be treated because um, I'm just uh, completing, uh, you know, six weeks of antibiotic therapy. Okay. And, you know, I've, I've had a couple of flares, but they've been getting briefer. And I'm hoping that this may take care of the problem. But one of the questions that we're holding for the future is whether or not I may uh, benefit from rituxan. Because the other thing that I'm finding in the patient community is that I keep meeting other uh, so-called so seronegative people who seem to have histories of Lyme disease or show some antibody response to um, uh, Lyme antibodies? It's hard for me to say. I actually don't know the answer to that. I have right. not heard of anything like that, um, but uh, so I don't know the answer to that. Right, I understand. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we have, um, so we'll get through, we'll do maybe five more questions. I know there's a lot, so I apologize if we don't get to you. Um, a question from Amy, how long should IVIG clear to retest antibodies? Um, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I think a, a few folks are asking if they have an IVIG treatment, can they, how soon afterwards can they test for antibodies? Will it, will it impact that test at all? If you received IVIG, yes. I don't know that it impacts the test because IVIG is pooled normal human globulin. Whereas these antibodies are specifically tested towards proteins from the uh, neuromuscular junction. So they, they, are, they are actually tested towards the musk protein, towards the acetylcholine receptor protein. So the uh, receiving IVIG should not cause a false positive or a false negative um, antibody test. Thank you so much. A question from Carol. Could there be an identifiable connection between MG, MG and transverse myelitis? Uh, they're similar. They're both, well, some forms of transverse myelitis are autoimmune. So in that way, there may be similarities but I don't know of a connection via antibodies, similar antibodies and such. Uh, so to take a step back, one step back there, so it's not uncommon for patients with myasthenia gravis to have thyroid disease, to have pernicious anemia and vitamin B12 deficiency and other autoimmune diseases. So there may be an overlap. And so, uh, it, so there, there, there seems to be some in these diseases some sort of breakdown of um, uh, problems of the cell, not just at the neuromuscular junction, but at other places too, the thyroid, for instance. And so it wouldn't be surprising, uh, although we tend not to see too many uh, patients where they have serious diseases, like say autoimmune transverse myelitis and myasthenia. Thank you so much. On a related note, somebody asked, um, you mentioned that LRP4 can also have a connection to ALS. Um, could that cause tremors? Uh, not that I know. And we have one, another uh, panelist. Cynthia, I'm going to unmute your line, Cynthia, so you can ask a question. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, my issue has been, I've had, um, I went to the doctor for the ptosis of my left eye and I didn't realize it, but I was extremely fatigued and had been for several months. And I, I, it was so bad that I, I had days that I couldn't go to work. I was under a lot of stress and I would literally lay in the bed all day long for a couple of days and could not do anything. I went to a neurologist and he um, said he was pretty sure that I had MG. They did the um, 
test I've had the musk and the um, what's the other test? The A, the A. Receptor antibody, yeah. Yes, and they were both negative. I'm scheduled for a single fiber EMG next week and further testing um, in Atlanta at Emory Cl Clinic or anyway. How can you be negative? How is it really hard to t to find the disease? That's my question. Because and and I um respond to the mestinin really well. I can't make it without it. Okay, so uh, again, good question. Uh, the disease can be difficult to diagnose, and that is one of the reasons I called it the snowflake disease because it presents differently in different people. You know, if it presented the same way in everybody, then it's easy to pick it up, right? But the symptoms can be like this. I mean, you're so tired, you can't get out of bed. Uh, you know, uh, the droopy eyelid. Symptoms can be very different. So the disease can be different to diagnose. And that's why it's sort of important to see and Emory is a good place. It's important to see people who know the disease and who can recognize it. And so I think you're on the right track because you may have seronegative myasthenia, but uh, then your doctors are planning to do the electrophysiology now and see if they can make a diagnosis. You may remember the slide I showed where I said it's a clinical diagnosis, so we want these symptoms, and then we want uh, you know, all of these other things that we use for testing, including antibodies, the electrophysiology, and the response to uh, agents, and you said you responded to mestinol. So I think you're on the right track for your diagnosis, and yes, it can be a difficult to make diagnosis, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, thank you, so, thank you so much. Yeah, many patients come to us um, you know, uh, undiagnosed or with vague symptoms uh, uh, that are not easy to sort of put into that box and say, yes, my senior it takes a while. Okay, that that um, really answers a lot for me because I've been so, um, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's just a terrible place to be not knowing, you know, and until you get to somebody that says, yes, that I believe you've got this. Because I went to doctors and doctors and they were like, well, you know, we're just not sure. But I almost got to the point where I just, I mean, I literally could not function. And I was having extreme um, trouble breathing in the summer. I live in Alabama and the um, heat is, um, in the summertime is terrible. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I hear you. Thank you so much. So we'll do uh, one question that a few callers had is that, um, can, can chronic stress or large levels of stress trigger myasthenia gravis or, or in some cases even cause it? Yeah, it can certainly trigger myasthenia gravis. So it's sort of like the infection uh, issue. Uh, I don't think it causes it, but the first episode may happen on the background of severe stress. So you sort of say, well, that's what caused it. Um, uh, but I don't think there's a causative link, but yes, it certainly can trigger it and it can exacerbate it. So if, if somebody's controlled or somebody's, you know, just doing reasonably well, their symptoms may get worse during periods of extreme stress for sure. Thank you. And our last question, uh, Philip is from Philip. He asked if there's any connection between fibromyalgia and an MG, generalized MG. Yeah, not that I know of. I mean, one thing though is that they can look similar because patients with fibromyalgia may also have chronic fatigue and may be very tired. Although patients with fibromyalgia usually have more pain than uh, in addition to the tiredness. And therefore, a mycena usually that typically is not painful. But chronic fatigue can certainly be a confused or there may be a concern for myasthenia gravis because those patients have severe tiredness. Uh, the, the difference though is uh, the fatigue in myasthenia gravis, although we, you know, many patients will tell me that they feel tired. The classic symptom though is what we talked about as fatigability, which means you use a muscle and it gets tired. You use your arms to wash your hair and your arms get tired. Uh, you know, it's not at that time, your whole body doesn't get tired, your arms get tired. There is a degree of fatigue. Many patients with myasthenia will tell me that they get very tired overall to just a general feeling of tiredness. But the classic symptom, which is based on the pathophysiology and that we need for the diagnosis is this weakness of a specific muscle group when you use it. I hope that answers your question. Yes. 
So I'll just take this opportunity to thank all of our attendees. Thank you for your attentiveness, for your really great questions, your thoughtful questions, and a huge thanks to you, Dr. Narayana Swami, for taking the time out and doing this given your busy schedule. Um, we really appreciate it and we're getting nothing but positive feedback in the chat box and, and a, special, uh, a special thanks and great job from your daughter I noticed was in the chat box too. So uh, some of your loved ones are watching as well. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Thank you all for attention. Thank you for spending the time with me. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, this webinar will be posted to the MGFA myasenia.org website and it will also be on our YouTube channel as well and we'll uh, make a post on social media once it is ready. But thank you all for your time, and I hope you have a good rest of your evening.